The new town of Columbia, Maryland came out of the ground in 1967. Prior to this momentous occasion in our lives, the Rouse Company, under the leadership of Jim Rouse, had formed what was known as the Columbia Work Group, a group by means of which Jim planned to brainstorm, discuss, and enlarge upon the ideas he and I had discussed over the previous 10 years for the building of a new town, a model city, one which could serve as possible solutions to the many problems of our inner cities. The work group was made up of experts of, on all facets of a city, from government to education to transportation to housing to the arts, churches, overall design, and so forth. Jim then held meetings focused on each of these components separately. One of the surprising things he learned, and I too from some of the meetings that I attended, was that when Jim would tell the experts that here was a brand new opportunity, a clean sheet of paper, a chance to dream their dreams for a better, more model city, no one had any ideas. We would just sit there. No one could come up with anything. We then also learned that after a few days or so, that the experts would come back to us with much excitement and many ideas. It's as though we all walk around with dreams in our head, but when confronted with a chance to make them come true, we can't pinpoint them. When the focus was on the churches, I remember a man from National Council of Churches named Stanley Hallett, who after just such a meeting, when no one reacted much, came back very excited about the opportunity for the National Council's participation in the new town around the thinking of the Interface Center. Somewhere in the interim of all these happenings, the assistant to the presiding director of the work group gave Jim a book called Call to Commitment, written by Elizabeth Akana of the Church of the Savior, which was the story of that unusual church in Washington. Jim began reading excerpts to me in the early morning scrambles of getting up, getting children off to school and so <laughs> forth, and those experts excerpts had such an impact on me, I read the book the very first chance I had. This led to my excitement about that church and I said, Jim, we've got to go see if the seeming integrity of these people is real. For if it is, I'm home. Going to the Church of the Savior led to Jim's and my enthusiasms sweeping along with us Jane Mason, Dee Dee Levering, Neil Harris, and later Normie Harris, and lastly, John Levering. John was a disbelieving agnostic when all this began and made a lot of fun of us. But later he became totally and deeply committed, so much so he became our leader. It was a truly dramatic conversion that we witnessed. Jim and I, when we first went to the Church of the Savior, went to the Potter's Coffee House which was an outreach mission to the lonely in Washington, staffed and run by the volunteers of the church. This led us into going to the church's School of Christian Living, which met once a week for about four years. It was during this time that I kept saying to Jim and to Gordon, we've got to have an ecumenical coffee house church in Columbia. And Gordon kept saying to me, Libby, you must be the sounder of the call. Well, nobody uses that language but Gordon, but anyway, I sort of got the message. I should keep saying we had to have one. So during this same time, the seven of us began to meet in the Levering's house every Sunday morning for our own coffee house church. Dee Dee and John, who was also an artist, arranged the table in their dining room with beautiful hand-woven tablecloths, colorful tablecloths, and candles, and exquisite ceramic or floral arrangements, which gave us a feeling of awe. We pretty much followed the patterns of the potter's house, and we grew and grew in spirit and joy. From Dee Dee and John's, we decided to open up to the public because so many people wanted to come worship with us um, that we felt we should open up. 
So the group then decided to rent the second floor of King's Contrivance, where we stayed about a year, I think, and then moved on to one of the few old houses in Columbia, which was called the Manor House. By now, the winds blew as they listed, which is another Church of the Savior phrase. And there was really magic in our services in this wonderful old place. We had beautiful music, beautiful spontaneous prayers that were beyond us, beautiful hand-printed bulletins by Wes Yamaka, each with a different work of art every single Sunday. Um, some who came in those days today refer to me as those were the days of Camelot. But the Holy Spirit was truly with us, and when the Church of the Savior saw what they had spawned, their council legitimized us as one of their mission groups, and we were accepted in Columbia. So these are my memories of how we came into being, how we were born. <laughs>